college-based global community. And we are delighted to have a number of those students here with us tonight. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our young professionals here tonight. We hope all of the YPs in attendance will join us afterwards for an informal post-program discussion with our speaker over drinks and appetizers at Marathon Grill downstairs. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to invite Richard Wilson, <coughs> Council Officer and President of InnoVest Group, to the podium. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back to the Council's podium, Barack Khanna. He's been with us several times and participated in a terrific panel discussion on superpowers of the 21st century in 2008. And in 2009, he was a keynote speaker for our Inside Washington Week and was rated one of our top speakers. <coughs> my dad, my dad, he, he would have loved to have been open, to have been open, to have been able to open the Inside Washington program this week. It's not on. It's on. It's no. just you're taller than most of us. But unfortunately, he'll be in Singapore during that time. However, we are lucky to have the opportunity to hear him tonight. And we can also join, you can also join our Washington Week program in April to hear many other great speakers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about him. Prague Connick is the director of the Global Gov these are great titles, the Global Governance Initiative and Senior Research Fellow in the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation, which I think is located in New York, Washington. He is also a partner in the advisory firm Hybrid Realities, and with his wife, Aisha Khanna, directs the Hybrid Reality Institute, which, Institute, which explores human technology, co-evolution, co and its implications for society, business, and politics. Dr. Khanna served on the Foreign Policy Advisory Group to the Barack Obama for President campaign, and during 2007, was a senior political advisor to the United States Special Operations Forces in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Earlier, he held positions at the Brookings Institute, the World Economic Forum in Geneva, and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. In 2008, he was named one of the Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century, and was one of 15 individuals featured in Wired Magazine's smart list. In 2009, he was honored as a young global leader in the World Economic Forum. Dr. Khanna is widely published and quoted in media around the world. His articles and reviews have appeared in numerous publications including the International Herald Tribune, Washington Post, Financial Times, Forbes, Time, and Newsweek. He has been featured on a number of TV and radio programs including CNN, BBC, PBS, Al Jazeera International, and National Public Radio, among many others. He is the author of the international best-selling book, The Second World, Empires and, and Influence in the New Global Order, which has been translated into over a dozen languages. And his latest book, How to Run the World, Charting a Course for the New Renaissance, will be the focus of, his, of this evening's program and will be available following tonight's program for signing and sale. Dr. Khanna holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's and master's degrees from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. A truly international figure, Dr. Khanna was born in India, grew up in the United Arab Emirates, New York, and Germany, and has traveled in more than 100 countries on all continents. And tonight, we are delighted to have him here in Philadelphia to speak with us. <coughs> Dr. Khan. Thank you. Good evening. It's great to be back here. Um, this is one of those moments in time where people like me, geopolitical junkies, this is what we live for. Uh, it's the kind of moment where you, where you rip up your speech and you just uh, you know, meditate and, and reflect on, on how amazing world dynamics can be, the kind of moment that, uh, that you wait for, actually, and have to keep on waiting for, no matter how much you know, no matter what kind of expert you are about the world, you never really know when the tipping point is going to come, right? 
Uh, but I will say, to back, to back up about five years, when I was traveling uh, around the world for about two and a half years to write my first book, uh, The Second World, I spent a tremendous amount of time in, um, in the following countries. Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Jordan, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, so on and so on. Months and months and months and months and months. And um, got okay at, at Arabic, but, but mostly was meeting everyone I could. Students, bloggers, activists, revolutionaries, uh, politicians, members of parliament, ministers, uh, you know, taxi drivers, waiters, waitresses, and you, you name it. Um, and I, I sort of sized up, my methodology is kind of different from other political scientists. Uh, you know, I, I read the books, I take my notes, I integrate it into a framework, but then I pack it all in a drawer, and I, and I go and I travel. Uh, and so, after I, after when I was finally ready to leave Egypt, uh, this is at some point in 2006, um, you know, in my, my notepad, in my notes, I said, Egypt is ripe for revolution. And, and there it is, there those words stand somewhere in the, in the middle uh, of my last book. And so I've been waiting and waiting and waiting uh, for that to actually happen, to vindicate me. And you can see I'm kind of smiling about this, and, and obviously th things have been, um, it's been a mixed picture the last few weeks. Obviously, all has not been pretty. All has not been good in Bahrain. There's a lot of um, a lot of trouble, a lot of unrest. Look at Libya. There's a lot of brutality. Syria as well. Uh, you know, rev a revolution is not a dinner party. Mao Zedong famously said, and this won't be either. But let me say this: it could be so much worse. These regimes are have been so much worse than what we have seen them do in the last few weeks. And all those times that they did all those nasty things to their people, we often weren't paying attention, maybe we were even supporting it. Uh, this time is actually different. You know, for decades and decades, we have faced this paradox. We have either explicitly or quietly talked about democracy promotion, economic reform, uh, and progressive governance, but we never wanted to touch the leaders. And that was a paradox that we simply could not transcend. So. We just waited and waited and waited, and then it happened. It happened for us. And now we don't face that paradox as much anymore because a lot of these regimes are gone. They're going or they're gone. Now, I'm as familiar as anyone can be with the fact that even if you bring in next generation, young leaders uh, who talk about reform, they're still surrounded by their daddy's secret polices and, and secret services who are going to maintain a grip on power. That's what's happening in Syria right now. Uh, even Saif al-Qadhafi himself, you know, who, who talked about reform for six or seven years, obviously didn't get very far because of who his father is and who his, who his father still is, in fact. But that said, one way or the other, they're all going to go. They're all going to go, or at least they're all going to modernize, they're all going to change. And therefore, very, very logically speaking, if this part of the world has had the worst governments that they could have had, it could only go up, it could only get better. From here. And I think it will. And I think it has a lot to do with a combination of a certain set of factors. Before I mention those factors, I want to say that it's important to distinguish between what we're seeing right now and the kind of deeper forces and deeper trends at play, which is what a lot of this book is about. Um, a lot of people say failed states. That's a trend, right? You can pick up any magazine and say, what are the top trends of the 21st century? You can say, failed states this, or uh, technology revolutions, things like this. Those are not trends. It's very important to be somewhat scientific about this. Those are just manifestations of much deeper trends. The deepest trend that <coughs> play here in the Middle East is what I devote the middle chapters of this book to. It's what I call post-colonial entropy. That's a fancy way of saying the world is falling apart. Okay? Why do I say that? The world has 200 countries. 60 years ago, when the United Nations was founded, there were less than 100 countries. We've doubled the number of countries in the world. Are they all really sovereign, equal, competent, coherent, even respectable nations and governments? Not really. I don't, those aren't the words that come to mind when I think of Libya today. Uh, it probably isn't for you either. What these countries have experienced in the last 60 years since independence, decolonization, has been largely lack of investment infrastructure, very corrupt governance, tripling or quadrupling of their populations, no new national ideology that compels loyalty among the people, and a general uh, sort of you know, pattern of suppression, 
uh, externalizing the enemy, blaming Israel, blaming America, blaming anyone, but not taking responsibility for themselves. That is decay. There, it had to come to a point where that decay crosses over that tipping point into collapse. So when people say, what's the trend at play here? It's not, oh, there's a bunch of failed states, or oh, these regimes are falling. The deeper trend is this entropy. This entropy is ripping not just the Arab world, it's actually kind of a worldwide phenomenon. A lot of people have been asking me lately, is this going to spread outside the region to a place like, uh, like, like Pakistan? And I'm like, hold on a minute. Pakistan is already way beyond what the Arab countries are. What do you mean is this going to spread? It's already in such an advanced state of entropy that I don't think the country can even hold together at all. In the Arab world, we're talking about reforming governments, improving them, providing <coughs> people, and uh, you know, building state capacity, nation building, all these, all these things, because we still believe these places can, can actually hold together. I don't actually think that a place like Pakistan can even do that. It's much larger, right? Almost 200 million people. So just bear in mind this concept of entropy. When you look at the map of the world today, and you're starting to track and see and plot where these revolutions are happening. We weren't talking about Jordan and Syria last week. Now we are. A week before that, we weren't talking about uh, you know, other, other places. One by one by one by one by one. There are 200 countries in the world. More than half of them are post-colonial countries. Most of those are borderline failed states or already over the edge. And it's not something that started at the end of the Cold War, the last 10 years, 15 years. It's not something that's just very, very recent because of Twitter and Facebook, even Al Jazeera, which I, I celebrate because of the way in which it shines a spotlight on, on, on a lot of these governments. This has been going on. These countries have been dying since the day they were born. And that's what I devote uh, you know, some chunk of, the, of this book to, saying, well, so what do you actually do about it? What you do about it is many things, and I want to kind of you know bring it straight to the headlines uh, as well, because Obama is giving a speech tonight defending uh, you know his policy so far, and he has to defend it on two levels. The first is why are we going to war? Isn't this illegal? I would say no, because for one thing, there are regional organizations involved that have invited the United States to support humanitarian operations. The Arab League has sanctioned this. The European Union is involved in this and the UN Security Council has approved this. We are not necessarily at war. We, as, as you probably know, we haven't outright declared war in quite a while. It's something of a lost art. In fact, there is a, a book that came out recently titled The Lost Art of Declaring War. And so it, it wouldn't be such a thick book if we weren't uh, finding very clever ways to not declare war while doing it. But I don't think that what's happening right now is the kind of thing where it requires a sort of you know, congressional sanction. I would like for Congress to actually get its act together and do that much as I would like the United Nations to much more quickly deliberate on whether or not Gaddafi has been uh, conducting atrocities and therefore sanctioning more aggressive operations against him. But alas, these things take a lot of time and I don't think that Obama should be wasting time waiting for them. So that's one thing. The other uh, more, more important question is, does he have a strategy? And this is where I really like what we're doing. It's all too easy for people to attack him from the left and from the right. From the very beginning he said, that this is an Arab situation. The Arab League is actually convening and doing something, which is a real shock for anyone who follows uh, Arab politics. The European, the Europeans have gotten together and decided to do something, to recognize the, uh, the National Council uh, government of Eastern uh, Libya, and uh, to, to put together a military coalition. France has been lead. For anyone who follows European <coughs> politics, this is also a great shock. Yeah. So for those of us who have been raised on a healthy diet of America as the world's policeman, no one can do anything without us, whatever, uh, you know, finally we're seeing some action. And Obama is saying, yes, America has very unique military and other kinds of capabilities that we are willing to use and support. And sometimes we'll take the lead. We'll do strikes before others. We'll strike targets that others can't. That's fine. But we're doing it because the Arabs, and this is the Arab world that's at stake here, have invited us to do it. We're doing it because the, the great powers that are proximate to the situation and have to deal with the aftermath of this more than we do, which is the Europeans, they are on board. In fact, they've taken the lead. They recognize this Libyan, uh, new Libyan government before we did. And we're doing it because the United Nations has sanctioned it. This would not have been the case in the last 10 years, right? And yet, that's exactly what's happening now. So we have managed to combine caution with action. That's really, really remarkable. So I actually applaud uh, the way Obama has been handling this so far. But don't expect him to provide the long-term answer to what is going on here. 
A lot of people are going to say, what's the strategy? What's the outcome? What's the end state? The whole point of letting Arabs lead their own revolutions, which they are doing right now, which we have, in many cases, stopped them from doing, remember, based on our support for some of the dictatorships in the region, is to let them decide where this is going to go. And just to make sure, as much as we can, exercise as much leverage as we can, to make sure that there isn't an unnecessary loss of life in the process. And again, we're actually doing a moderately good job of that. Maybe we shouldn't be do dealing with Bahrain uh, the way we are in terms of turning a blind eye to what Saudi Arabia is doing. There are trade-offs, there are double standards, there is a bit of hypocrisy, that's always the case. But just because we're not um, stopping the Saudis from what they're doing in Bahrain, it doesn't mean that we can't help the Libyans and we can't help people in other countries. So we, we have limited capacity, but we do what we can. So how does this all this tie into to this book? Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Arab world and, and writing about these, these deeper forces that I see at play, particularly this issue of post-colonial entropy, what does state building really mean, how, do, how important are regional organizations, which is an entire level of international relations <laughs> that we just tend to ignore. We tend to think of great powers, superpowers, multilateral organizations, and everyone else is just a little, you know, just a, a sort of uh, icing on the cake. And in fact, again, regional organizations are very important, and that's another big theme of this book. A lot of people right now who are talking about global security issues are saying, we will have a better global security system if we reform the UN Security Council. Let's expand it from 15 countries to 25 countries. Let's have India have a permanent seat, Brazil should have a permanent seat, Japan should have a permanent seat, and so forth. No one is asking, is that actually going to lead to action? Is that going to lead to a more efficient model of global security? And I challenge anyone to tell me that expanding the UN Security Council, as legitimate and noble a goal as that may be to salvage the legitimacy of that core part of the UN, tell me how that's going to save anyone's life. And I'm not sure that it will. And that brings us to the kind of core message of this book. I'm not interested in global governance as we know it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a term that's on my business card, <laughs> global governance. And there are a lot of people who work on it. And 99% of the people who work on global governance basically sit around and play with org charts. I know, I've been doing this for years. <laughs> and those org charts are usually the org charts of the United Nations, and the World Bank, and the IMF, uh, and the World Trade Organization, and so forth. As if that map, that organogram, really reflects the reality of the world. But I attack those maps, I attack those charts. I'm telling what I just told you earlier <coughs> about the post colonial entropy is my way of saying that that Rand McNally map of the world is a complete joke. That the borders that are on it, the countries that are on it, in half the cases, don't reflect anything like a neat and tidy reality. Well, the same thing goes in spades for the maps and charts of global governance. We will not solve the world's problems by talking about silver bullets, like reform the UN Security Council, strengthen the IMF, let the G20 handle all the world's problems, right? Financial stability, Iran, climate change, or let's have a new global environmental organization, right? And that will tackle climate change. Let's have another summit. Kyoto, Bali, Copenhagen, Cancun, uh, pick the next sunny resort of your choice, where there will be a big summit and people will fly there and burn lots of emissions, and, and get around to negotiating a treaty that will never, ever be ratified, right? This is the world, this is the global governance system that people think of when they think of global governance. And it gives global governance a bad name, and it gives diplomacy a bad name. And the very purpose of this book is to turn all of that completely on its head. In one sentence, the best global governance is local governance. And in one sentence, the diplomacy of talk is the worst kind of diplomacy. The diplomacy of action is what we need a lot more of. The reason these organizations are losing so much legitimacy, the reason they're being bypassed by NGOs, by companies, by anyone who has a shovel and wants to go and do something, the reason is because legitimacy doesn't just derive from where you sit on the org chart. It doesn't derive from what international law, what powers international law gives you. The world is very impatient. Legitimacy derives from doing something. That's why the Gates Foundation is not a democratically elected, legitimate organization, but I haven't been to a country in Africa or in Asia that doesn't uh, give priority to a meeting with Bill Gates or his representatives over any diplomat from Italy or even from the United States, because he does something. So this is not rocket science. You know, those org charts are wrong in the way
way that they map out global governance. And for me, legitimacy now derives from action. And the diplomatic map that I try to paint in this book is one in which it's not, a, it's not about against states, it's not against international organizations, it's about releasing resources and empowering local actors as much as possible. Let me give you some examples of that. We've been in Afghanistan now for almost 10 years, right? 9-11 is coming up, the 10th anniversary this year. It took until late last year for the Pentagon to say, oh my God, we're gonna be occupying this country forever unless we actually bring in private actors, investors, businesses, companies, we need them to turn this country into what it has been or was for thousands of years, which is a Silk Road. It's a landlocked country, it has resources, you can transit natural gas and oil through it, you can extract minerals from it, you can grow pomegranates and raisins there, and yet this really wasn't the central focus of our policy. We said, well, Afghanistan is a security problem, right? Therefore, the military leads in the security problems, and stability problems, and terrorism problems. And 10 years later, we haven't solved the security problem, the stability problem, or the terrorism problem. Because you can't let, you can't treat issues in these silos the way we do, and the way a lot of these international you know, organizations do, and the way our own government does. Instead, the Pentagon has, has created something called the Office of Business and Stability Operations last year, where it said, we need to start flying some CEOs in here. So they did. So they've got American businesses, and they're saying, please open up a factory in Kandahar. Uh, please start building some roads in, uh, around uh, Mazari Sharif. Please help get some of these businesses going so Afghanistan can export some goods, so it can earn some revenue, so it can not be dependent on us, so that, it, so that people will have less motivation to join uh, the jihad or the insurgency. Again, it was so obvious. And yet, for almost 10 years, we hadn't been doing it. And the reason is because we still think of you know, diplomacy, leadership, and, uh, and our foreign policy is only that which our government does. And that's the biggest mistake we can make. In the 21st century, diplomacy is so much more than just what Hillary Clinton does. It's so much more than just what the State Department does. You all know that how emasculated the State Department is. We only have 5,000 foreign service officers. Is that the sum total of American diplomacy? It's not. What our military does is diplomacy, they negotiate with others. What our, what our companies do is diplomacy, we negotiate with other governments, with other companies, we form supply chains, uh, we gain access to markets, we invest in foreign countries, we develop their labor force, we change their regulations, all of that is diplomacy too. Our <coughs> NGOs do diplomacy. America is the most charitable society in the world, hands down, right? What Americans donate to causes has a big impact on the ground. What our universities do is part of diplomacy. We have uh, 30 or 40 American universities operating across the Middle East at a time when we are such an unpopular government. Students are lining up to, to apply to, to study at American uh, college uh, campuses that are in the heart of the Middle East. Why? Because they actually want an American education. We have an enormous global footprint, and that footprint goes well beyond what our government alone delivers. And so we have this big misconception about diplomacy as being something that emanates only from Washington. But to me, when I hear that the World Affairs Council has run, runs multiple trips to Iran, how many American diplomats have been to Iran? Way more members of the World Affairs Council have been to Iran than there are American diplomats that have been to Iran, at least uh, post-1979, right? And when I was in Europe last week, in Germany and in the UK, they have, they have diplomatic relations with Iran. And they're always saying to me, God, your Iran policy is so messed up. Frozen for 32 years now, achieving absolutely nothing. We have all this knowledge about the country, all this time spent on the ground, but your diplomats spend all their time browbeating us to not engaging with Iran. That's, a, in a nutshell, American foreign policy towards Iran. Now, it has its strength and its, and its weaknesses. Diplomacy is obviously about coercion, about persuasion, about lots of different things, a mix of carrots and sticks, obviously. But that's exactly the problem. Our policy has been so black and white. And if it's broke, you've got to fix it. And we haven't been necessarily doing that. It brings up the point, really, about engagement. If you're not engaging, then you're not exercising diplomacy at all. You're abdicating your participation in diplomacy, which is precisely why when World Affairs Council delegations go over there, to me, that's a form of diplomacy. And there's a whole field built around what's called track two diplomacy, citizen diplomacy, citizen engagement. I think those kinds of diplomacy are actually extremely important. 
Uh, and I think that they play a very complementary role to what governments do. Take the issue of Palestine. Last time I checked, we still don't have a two-state solution or any solution. But we've been having rose garden ceremonies about the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. We've handed out several Nobel Peace Prizes for that dispute for the last 30, 35 years. It hasn't really gotten us past the finish line. I think one dimension that we have ignored to a large extent is people-to-people -people diplomacy, which is absolutely essential if you want people to live in peace side by side. We've ignored the economic dimension. We felt that, oh, no, no, you have to sort out the security issues. You have to negotiate the final status issues. And then all of these things will just magically happen. What if you just flip that on its head? What if you say, if you actually built a viable Palestinian economy, then that entity could actually survive on its own. It would have a much greater case for its own independence. It wouldn't be either a political and security dependent on others. It wouldn't be an economic client of various UN agencies and donor groups and things like this. But that's not the way people tend to think about these things. They think that you can regulate it all on paper, have lots of cute ceremonies about it, give out lots of prizes, but that would still bring us to where we are today. So I'm for diplomacy on all of these different levels. That involves citizens, involves companies, involves NGOs, involves government agencies, the UN and so forth. There is no either or. I'm not one of those people who says, the market's going to solve all the problems, or let Bill Gates and civil society solve all the world's problems, and it'll all be okay. It's about smarter partnerships between public and private actors. It's about .gov, the .com, the .org, the .edu, and also the .god religious groups and those actors. They're all very, very involved in, this, in this, uh, this landscape of 21st century diplomacy. I think there's enormous potential in that. If the world of intergovernmental, interstate diplomacy <coughs> has gotten us to where we are today, and we still have so many problems, so many unanswered questions, so many challenges, climate change, human rights, democracy promotion, economic growth, public health, you name it. Well, the governments have done about as much as they can. We're not giving more money to foreign aid, are we? Other governments aren't either. The UN certainly doesn't have enough money or enough resources to solve those problems. Where is it going to come from? Where are the solutions going to come from? But there's an enormous amount of resources that are out there in NGOs, in civil society, in our corporations, in diaspora groups, in universities, and so forth. Harnessing that potential is really what the future of diplomacy is going to be about. Combining the resources from these different sectors, that's what's going to generate the kinds of solutions that we need. And you can see example after example after example. I think you know, this book could have been twice as long, but my editors didn't, didn't want it to be just a laundry list of all of the wonderful things that are actually going on out there when you see public and private resources combined. But the, the examples are literally endless. And so I kind of do organize the book um, functionally. You know, is it about economic growth? Well, you could have a stimulus package after stimulus package, but you'd eventually sputter to a stop. Or you can attempt to stimulate innovation in the private sector, and that ultimately is how you do, in fact, create jobs public private cooperation. Uh, you can talk about terrorism. You can say, we need to drain the swamps. We need to bomb them to wherever. Uh, but you also need to create jobs through foreign investment, risk insurance guarantees, things that banks do, things that UN agencies do, things that governments also do things that local entrepreneurs do, that's what it actually takes to drain the swamps. It involves more than just governments, more than just militaries. You want to solve climate change? Well, again, you can have lots of big summits in world capitals, but you also have to have innovation, clean technology coming from Europe, coming from Japan, coming from the United States, finding mechanisms to subsidize it, to transfer those technologies to, to <coughs> polluting, industrializing countries so that they will reduce their emissions. You can't legislate that. You have to innovate that. Governments don't innovate those things. Companies do. Problem, you want to promote human rights? Well, at the United Nations, it's premised on respect for sovereignty. So how are you, how are you, how are you criticize what China does in Tibet? You can't actually do much of that at the United Nations. Right? But Amnesty International can do that, and they do. Human Rights Watch can do that, and they do. These NGOs, a lot of which people think of as being in opposition to governments, or, uh, or simply being on the outside, being on the margins. Let me tell you what the fastest growing NGO that I'm aware, Western NGO, in China is. It's called Business for Social Responsibility. They used to have a staff of like six in Beijing. Now it's a staff of 36. That's at the invitation of the Chinese government because they said, 
we like you. You provide us with technical assistance and you help us actually improve and enforce labor rights and labor standards in our factories. We actually train our factory managers. So an NGO is doing more to improve human rights on the ground in China than sending over our bureaucrats to go and read out lectures to the Chinese government. They're not listening. They're not listening to that. But they're actually welcoming the NGOs that are helping them reform. So those are just a few examples of the amazing stuff that's actually going on on the ground. If you look at diplomacy, not through the traditional framework of just what governments do, but what I call mega diplomacy, the combination of public, private, civic kinds of actors. And the mega diplomacy framework is what I try to project in this, in this book. Because really, the genie is out of the bottle. This is an irreversible sort of situation. The empowerment of all of these actors come NGOs and so forth, is not something that's ever going to be reversed. Um, because globalization is a force greater than all of us. It distributes, it dissipates, it spreads power and authority in all kinds of directions. And therefore, we actually have to come to grips with it. We have to stop the conversations about who gets to regulate who, who has the upper hand, um, uh, and start thinking much more about who's partnering with whom, who's deploying the resources, how are we collaborating. And I find far too much of the former conversation going on in Washington and, far, and a far more inspiring amount of the latter conversation going around outside of Washington. And that's why, maybe that's why I spent so little time in Washington. I don't know. <laughs> but it's certainly, I think, the best way to get fresh ideas is to go and to travel and to see um, this, this incredible display of creativity, diplomatic creativity and innovation that's happening all over the world. And what I've tried to do with this book is just to start a conversation around that and to kind of basically rid us of any excuses that we might possibly have about why we don't each think of ourselves as diplomats. Because I, I officially think of all of you here uh, in this room as diplomats. Thanks very much. I'm all in favor of democracy in Middle East, Arab, and Libya, and Egypt, and everywhere. But is there a, they didn't, never had an opposition party or leaders like we have in India, two party system like in England. And do you see any leadership that can take over like Mubarak and Gaddafi? Thank you. You know, uh, so you're asking if the next set of leaders might be as bad as the ones that have just uh, left uh, office. Um, I don't think that the current dynamics in these countries will allow that to happen. Already in Tunisia and in Egypt, you have seen prime ministers and other cabinet ministers being sacked within one week of being appointed the job because people went back on the street and they said, and they said, you appointed this rubber stamp guy and he's actually not delivering. Get him out. And they're going to keep on doing that week after week after week until the Egyptian military and the Tunisian power brokers realize that they can't get away with it. Everyone is watching now. Everyone is holding government's feet to the fire and forcing them to reform a lot faster than they would like. And so I think that's actually a very positive thing. When you see, when you wake up in the morning and you turn on the news or you open the newspaper and you read about how a government has been dismissed, uh, they've been sacked, uh, or something like that, that's a very good thing. It means that another attempt at a corrupt uh, holding on to power by the old guard has been thwarted. And rather than letting it ossify like a Mubarak for 30 years, instead it lasted three days. And I want those governments to keep falling. I want government every week to keep falling. Because then that, that those, those old regimes that think that they can cheat the people, trick the people, get away with it, are going to finally give up and realize that they can't do it anymore. This is what happened to Mubarak, right? Day one it was, okay, fine, I'll repeal the emergency laws. Day two it was, okay, fine, I'll appoint a vice president. Day three it was, okay, fine, you know, we'll have early elections. Uh, and then finally it was, it was, oh, damn, I really need to get out of here <laughs> because they really aren't satisfied. And yes, it's a very imperfect and ad hoc form of accountability to take things out onto the street. But it's a lot better than waiting even six months
for what are sure to be flawed elections. In fact, what just happened today? Egypt announced it's probably going to delay its next round of presidential elections. I'm not at all surprised. Not at all surprised. The, it, we focus, and I, you've heard this critique from many people standing right here at this podium, when we talk about democracy, we focus too much on elections and not enough on substance, right? I mean, at least 20 people have probably stood here and said the same thing. Here's something that we don't do enough of. We don't focus enough on constitutions. Here's what I have to say about this. I don't believe, I don't care who the next president of Egypt is. I don't care if it is a bloodthirsty Islamist. And I'll tell you why. What I care about is that the Constitution prevents anyone, whether his name is Mubarak or whatever the case may be, from actually ever having the kind of power that Mubarak had. And therefore, my focus is not at all on the election. My focus is on the Constitution. I want to see the Constitution reformed, and I want to see them fighting out every single letter and article and measure and amendment until it makes clear that the president will never again be a powerful person, that it'll be a figurehead, and that's it. The last thing you want these countries to have, actually, is a Republican form of government. They already have that. This is what makes us, ironically, not very good at promoting democracy, or at least not the kind of democracy we want these countries to have. We want them to have, have multi-party parliamentary democracies. We don't have a multi-party parliamentary democracy. We have a two-party two presidential public. We obviously have checks and balances and separation of powers. We want them to have that. But we don't actually have a lot of experience in, uh, in training multi-party systems. That's what Europe looks like. You mentioned Britain, uh, Germany is like that, Italy is like that, and so forth. They need to actually be in the lead in doing this because we want those countries to look like Western European states. And you can only do that by changing the Constitution. We focus a lot on elections and who wins the election. And that's always been the problem. It's who comes next. It should never matter who comes next. A good government, the, the, the symbol of good government is what is having the what in place such that it doesn't matter who is in power. And that's what we need to be pushing for in this part of the world, especially since we don't really know who the next person is going to be. Um, I'm curious what you think. Curious what you think the, uh, the reason that your uh, prediction finally came true. Like, what was the, what changed? And I mean, my thoughts on this is, it, it's a loaded question, but is the spike in food prices. I mean, ultimately is what drove them over the edge and created things to be untenable, not just in Egypt, but across the region. And with that being the case, then it really doesn't matter who's in power because those fundamental imbalances of supply and demand aren't gonna be met by whatever group's in power. Well, you know, this was the third set of, or third wave of food riots that the Arab region has had in the last four or five years, right? Um, so it isn't solely attributable to the spike in food prices. So I, I completely agree with you, it was a major contributor. So was the food vendor who set himself on fire, so was the WikiLeaks table about Egyptian, about Tunisian corruption. Whole set of sparks sort of just came together. Obviously, though, the, the, the most systemic factor in the short term was the rise in food prices. But again, the longer term, uh, or the, the deeper instability in those societies has been planted for a long time. Again, the corruption, the overpopulation, and all those kinds of things. Um, so I think this has been, it was truly inevitable. Uh, I think we'll debate for a long time if, you know, a year or two from now, Saudi Arabia falls, the House of Saud collapses, are we going to say, began back then with the food riots? Did it begin in Tunisia, or was it something else? To me, the fundamental conditions are common across all these countries that make their collapse inevitable. So I wouldn't say it's any one thing, but I, I do agree that that, uh, that that the food issue was one of them. And, and yes, you're right, that if they don't deal with fundamental economic questions of providing basic goods and services, food in particular, then whichever government it is that comes next is going to collapse the next time there's a food price spike. They have been encouraged for a very long time to improve food stocks, to uh, improve local agricultural productivity, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and they haven't done it, they haven't done it well. And so yeah, this is, this is certainly uh, something that, that <coughs> needs to be fixed in each of these countries. I would hope that one lesson that whatever regimes come next in any number of these countries would, would get out of this is that they actually have to address, of course, the food supply issue first and foremost. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> unlike uh, the Middle East and North Africa, if you're talking about uh, change of government and so on, 
Uh, what about uh, places like uh, Yemen and uh, Southern Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on, where change is, in, except for India, um, where there is a, a severe, um, well, there's a great deal of, uh, or, or lack of literacy. How does that affect how there may be changes or may not be changes? I, I don't know if you can attribute uh, you know, future revolutions to the, I think a lot of these factors go hand in hand. I mean, societies that are poor, that are agricultural, and so forth, they're going to you know, have low, low literacy. Um, where I thought you were going was you know, other, other areas where we have strong man, sort of, you know, dictatorship types of systems. If you take Pakistan, which, which you mentioned, we backed Musharraf for almost a decade, right? And we, we tolerated him. We thought that he was, uh, we bought his rhetoric about being anti-corruption, um, uh, about, about improving economic growth and all these kinds of things. He didn't really do any of that. Literacy declined, agricultural productivity declined under Musharraf, right? Um, he brought some semblance of political stability, but, but that's actually literally a euphemism for authoritarianism. Right. So that's not the kind of stability you actually want. Case after case, we learn that when they fall, when these dictators fall, and we lift up the hood, we see just how corrupt and corrosive the whole situation was underneath, and we ignored it because we had one guy, you know, and we prefer the simplicity of that. So the, Pakistan has, has you know, literally collapsed in, in the last several years in a, a precipitous way. If Musharraf was doing even half of the good he said he was doing, there's no way it could have gotten so bad so fast. Because the truth is he never did any of those things. So yeah, literacy, overpopulation, uh, you know, again, the, the food supply issues, um, all, all play a really big role. And you know, you know speaking, of, speaking of India, um, there's even, even liberal, comfortable elites who I know in India today are writing articles in The Guardian saying, we're next. <laughs> I'm like, what do you, you know, what do you mean? Um, India's democracy, all of these things. They say, but the elite is still very detached, divorced, you know, from from ground level realities. Much of India is still, of course, very poor. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction uh, with government performance, and those are the common factors that can spark or instigate revolutions. So, I'm not saying that India is actually going to going to collapse. I am saying that. It's not just authoritarian governments. It's any place where there's poor governance, right? Any place where there's poor, even in a democracy, you can have a revolution. And so I think that that's something that, that basically the entire world needs to be careful of. Yeah. I need the microphone. What would the possible or in my words, probable financial economic collapse of the United States mean to the rest of the world? Well, I don't think we're going to have you know, a precipitous economic collapse. I mean, we run all kinds of scenarios on issues like, what if there's a run on the dollar? Uh, obviously, we have, you know, China has launched its own credit, credit rating agency and downgraded us. We deserve it, after all. Um, but I think that a lot hinges on what's happening right now in terms of our budget debate. Because you see, I mean, our debt is not really a number. Right? It's a number so large, it's not really comprehensible. Three, four, five trillion dollars, right? What does that actually mean? That's not 15, right? That, that's not a number that you actually ever pay, is it? That you can actually. So it's not a number, it's a concept, right? What foreign creditors are looking at right now, when they look at the United States, is not a country that has the capacity to pay this back, right? We don't. What they're looking for is a country that, what they're looking for is policies that could make us a country that could develop the kind of economy or, or modernize or shift to the kind of economy that will generate the kind of revenues that could one day pay that number, that concept back, and turn it from some ethereal number that's too large to ever comprehend into something that's actually concrete and can be hacked away at bit by bit. And so what's happening right now is that there are sort of, you know, deficit hawks, particularly on the Republican side, who say, got to free spending, the spending is getting out of control. But if you freeze spending and don't actually invest 
in your economy and actually making it productive and actually increasing exports, all these kinds of things, you're actually sending the wrong signal. The short-term policy of freezing spending and pretending that that's actually satisfying international creditors who don't want to see your, your deficits rise, that's the exact opposite of what I hear foreigners saying. Foreign creditors are saying, America needs to invest in infrastructure. America needs to upgrade its infrastructure. It needs to invest in new sectors of the economy. It needs to create new jobs. It needs to export. It needs to generate revenue. And they'll be pleased to see us spending that money because they'll be pleased to see us spending it right instead of wrong. And so I think that right now what is on the line in Congress is actually something where if we don't spend the money that we need on infrastructure and all these other things, that actually risks bringing us ever closer to the scenario that you're painting, where there is a run on the dollar and um, you know, a huge, uh, obviously, a spike in our, our interest rates, and it's going to tremendously uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, slow our economy. But if you try to answer my question about if there is a collapse, you don't believe there will be, but if there is, what will it mean? If there is a collapse, meaning yeah, the dollar is not even a world currency anymore, right? It becomes a uh, an Ecuadorian right. bolivar. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't think that that's that that's going to happen. I know, I know you don't. But yeah. how bad will it be if America is not in the lead? Well, we're already competing for the lead. America's share of global GDP is less than that of the European Union, right? I mean, people. People play all fun, kinds of funny games with statistics, sort of, you know, America's number one, and Japan is number two, and China has just surpassed Japan to be number two, and all these things. Let's face it, right now, in every country, they're going back to the drawing board and, and re revisiting how they even measure GDP to begin with. But the very notion of an economy is not linked to the national. So it's kind of ridiculous to not appreciate that the European Union is a larger, kind of actually, in some, by some measure, substantially larger economic weight than, than we are, and that, that is actually uh, the Eurozone Plus. So um, we're not really in the lead in that sense anymore. So I don't even know what one means. Uh, do you mean just the dollar as a reserve currency? Well, even that is, is uh, you know, declining uh, ever so slightly, but at an accelerating rate. But that doesn't mean that people want it to collapse because we owe people money in dollars. So if it's worthless, that's not going to do them a lot of good. Uh, what they do want to do, and this is where I actually see a lot of rational discourse going on, which is why I don't think this scenario is going to happen, because even China and other countries that might wish to sort of, you know, degrade our capabilities um, to use our financial assets to promote our influence, uh, they may wish to see that, but at the same time, they're also promoting these ideas like a common international currency, uh, diversified basket of global currency reserves involving uh, SDR, special drawing rights managed by the IMF. All of these kinds of conversations are taking place in which Chinese, Americans, and others are going about this in a very reasonable way, trying to find a kind of a win-win situation. Because it really isn't in anyone's interest to just see us, to see our uh, economy collapse. That's why I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Right here. Um, so I think that especially when um, like post-colonialism and when colonialism kind of fell, uh, people equate self-determination with having their own government. So I'm wondering, um, in a world where NGOs are more important than governments, how how do people have to rethink self-determination? Right. Well, you know, I would never say that NGOs are more important than governments. Right. I mean, it, it's it's. Um it's not either or. You have a lot of countries in the world where, like I said, the least developed countries, the LDCs, where NGOs and humanitarian agencies and UN bodies provide a substantial share, a majority of the public services in those countries. They are part of the governance uh, of those countries. Um, Self-determination is, is somewhat different. I mean, when a new country is born, like South Sudan was last month, uh, obviously it, for a while, exists on a certain lifeline. Uh, from these international organizations and agencies. Uh, that's why they're all flocking to Juba and setting up their operations and creating something of a very messy sort of mosh pit. Um, the same thing is already true in Palestine, even though it's not yet a country, and even when it becomes one, it's going to be dependent, obviously, to some extent, on international support. 
uh, Haiti, you know, has been uh, an aid uh, sort of um, sinkhole, really, for, for many, many years, even though it's actually, you know, a sovereign country. So it's not, there's no issue of self-determination there involved at all. But I don't think that we should hold the idea of self-determination hostage to the uh, economic weakness of certain countries, right? Uh, Kosovo, East Timor, all of, you know, these are, these are countries that have been born in the last decade, even though they're very economically weak. Uh, but, the, but in so many ways, their political uh, and economic evolution is held back by being a subservient part of a larger suppressive type of state. Uh, and so therefore, their, their liberation is, 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 is painful, but it's still something that they can maximize. And I think that we should be supporting countries to do that. Now, you know, most of my things, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of self-determination. Self and um, I believe that it's, that it's only one, the first step in a two-step process. The first step is to become independent. The second step, then, is to really melt down the borders that you've just created through uh, infrastructure, trade, and so forth. That's exactly what the European Union has done. You have 27 independent countries. Uh, but there are very few borders uh, between them, right? They have, they have more or less a single economy. The Schengen Agreement links a lot of the core countries together. There's no, there's no borders to cross when you drive uh, between them and so forth. So I think that that is what needs to happen in a lot of these places. If you solve the territorial disputes by creating new countries, the first thing those countries do is say, thank you for recognizing what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours. Now we can start to do business. And that's what will happen between Kurdistan and Turkey. That's what will happen even between Palestine and Israel. Uh, that's what will happen between North, North and South Sudan. Uh, th this, that is what will happen in the Balkan countries. Uh, you know, the, uh, less than 20 years ago, the horrific uh, war of dissolution in Yugoslavia, five new countries created, uh, one of which is a member of the EU already, another one which is slated to become a member in the next year or two, which is Croatia. And, uh, and all of which have st uh, stabilization association agreements with the EU, several of which already use the euro as their main currency. So, you know, these countries have fought horrific wars of independence, and yet, basically, in a short amount of time, they're going to become uh, part of something much larger, which is the EU. We have time for one more question. Sure. The United States, since the Second World War, has been involved in many disastrous overseas conflicts. What criteria can we use to determine whether we should or should not get involved in, in a particular area of the world? We got involved in Vietnam, it was a disaster. What, what the president's going to talk tonight, what, what would you advise him to say with respect to those kind of criteria, when we should or should not get involved? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer that I, that I think you want. Right. I mean, the answer that a lot of people are talking about right now is it has to be a vital national security interest. Those are really soothing words, aren't they? Like, who's going to define what vital is, right? Uh, but but you, would, you, would, you might love it if someone were to say, we're only going to intervene. Right? This is obviously not what Obama's going to say. But if someone were to say, Libya, nah, doesn't seem like all that strategic. Only 1.6% of global oil, so on, so on. You know, we don't have a lot of people there, and, and so forth. Therefore, we're not going to do that one. But we, you know, but we will do this one. We won't do that one. It, it's completely ad hoc. Even when you use the most precise, well, actually, it's not a precise term at all, but vital national interest, and set the bar this high, the truth is that it's utterly subjective, and you can get around it. I would much rather see, and I don't know if this is something that can be articulated in a speech, but I'd much rather see us saying, what are the regional dynamics in any given place? What is the capacity of other people to solve their own problems? How can we help them solve their own problems? How can we help the Arab League police Arab problems? How can we help the African Union police African problems? How can we help ASEAN police Asian problems, right? And not have to necessarily do so much ourselves. And that way, you're kind of intervening without intervening. You're helping tip the balance. You're helping promote stability. You're helping with peacekeeping operations. We're helping with money, with guidance, with technical resources, but you're not playing global cop and doing it yourself. That is, I think, the, the correct answer to the question. It's one I, you know, I spent a lot of time in this book spelling out why we should think about the regional level and help other people solve their own problems. That's what I think the vital uh, test should be. Do you, are there people on the ground who can solve this problem themselves, and can we provide some support to them so that we don't have to do it ourselves? And where we can do that, we should do that, because you make that investment 
and you prevent future crises down the road where you do have to get involved. 